I, I'm not going to introduce him because <laughs> you're more sick of him than you are me. But I do warn you, don't all disappear after this because you've got 10 minutes of me at the end of this. What you sh should have said is, here's the man that needs no introduction. <laughs> Give a big hand to him. <laughs> Are you wearing your pants? No, I'm wearing his pants. <laughs> <laughs> now that you ask, here are mine. These I received a couple of years ago when I gave a presentation. You can see the yellow stains on them already. <laughs> So I'm just going to go on the internet first, trying to find <coughs> And the very first thing I want to do, before I forget, is to go to the... Actually, this might have been the year when I got my, my, my underpants. A couple of years ago, there was this... Where is it? No, it wasn't isn't here. Maybe it was last year then. Yeah. So the point is if you want to is there another browser here? <laughs> So some of you have already seen this because it was presented last year. So uh, if you go outside, uh, if you want to go back to your hotel or something, and then want to come back to uh, the sauna, then uh, this is the main entrance. You should, I, I'm hoping you recognize the main entrance. Uh, and it, when you approach the main entrance, you'll notice that there is a small side door next to the entrance. And uh, next to that side door, there is this small thing. And if you go very close to it, you'll see that it has a button that says Counseling Sauna and the sauna should be a familiar word even for you foreigners. So press that and an intercom upstairs at the sauna will ring and somebody who's probably drunk will answer it and uh, try to make him comprehend that you want in. <laughs> and then you follow the corridor and to the left there is an elevator and that elevator will take you to the eighth floor. It won't take you anywhere else. You can push all the buttons you want, but it won't take you anywhere. And, uh, and then you'll be at the sound. Uh, also, uh, if you're smoking, you don't go, have to go outside anymore at the sauna because there's a terrace up there, so you can smoke on the terrace. And uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Uh, so basically, we were very worried about this year's attendance because we were we had digitized and physics uh, in addition to Trex hosting this event. So we were worried that we were going to have like hundreds of people here, and everyone would have wanted to come to the sauna. But it turned out that in addition to members and staff and, and sponsors, uh, a total of 58 people were interested in the sauna option, and the sauna has. Space for 60 people, so everyone who uh, said they're interested in sauna uh, fits in. So, welcome. And also about the dinner, uh, there were 75 people who registered for dinner. Welcome for that bit as well. I guess I'm taking your time from that, uh, although I won't be the last one, luckily. But that's just the numbers. And then to my actual presentation.
So uh, these are the services at Chex. And of course, the most important service is theory, or, well, <coughs> every member, of course, has their own view on what is the most important service, but Peering is what IXPs are there for. We, of course, try to expand uh, into being able to be as useful to our members as possible, but in addition to just peering. Uh, we've got multi two multicast peering VLANs as well, although there's really no one there. Uh, hopefully, after our digital's presentation today, there may be some more interest uh, for that in the future. And then there are private VLANs, and uh, there are multitudes of uses for private VLANs. For example, private peering or transit or, or uh, settlement-based peering or, uh, uh, I don't know, tons of you know, bit streaming. There are, there are tons of ideas that you can do in a private VLAN. Basically, uh, the public peering VLANs are limited to IPv4, IPv6, and ARP, but in the uh, private VLANs, Nobody cares what Ethernet types you use. And then uh, we have mailing lists. Well, if you are here, then you are probably at least on the workshop invites mailing list. Uh, there's also a mailing list called Early Warning System, which is where we start preparing these events. Uh, like this event, we started talking about the event in January. We basically started, uh, we decided there was a doodle poll of when we should have this. And there were about a dozen, if I remember correctly, about a dozen uh, votes on when it should be, and this was the winning day. And then uh, after that, we talked about the topics this year uh, for uh, presentation ideas, for sponsors, stuff like that. So if you want to get more involved, join the early warning system. Also, if you are, uh, if your calendar is challenging, because the workshop invites mailing list only has a warning one month before the event. If you need more advanced warning to be able to fit it into your calendar, then the early warning system is where you will find out earlier. Uh, then we have route servers. Uh, I'm very happy to report that uh, the majority of our members use the routing servers. So uh, everyone with an X or something in the member list uses these. Uh, also, all the ANYCAP services we host are also uh, available on the uh, route servers, and actually there might be a couple of services that we host that are not really available anywhere else other than the route server. Uh, then there's the AS112 project. Uh, this is probably a project you haven't <coughs> heard of. Uh, the idea here is that it hosts, it's an, auto, an autonomous system that hosts uh, the reverse zones, uh, IN-R path zones for the so-called gray networks. The networks you usually use behind your NAT. Uh, this was originally, they were, those zones didn't originally exist and uh, the root servers uh, got a, a lot of traffic for them. And uh, then uh, somebody somewhere had the idea that maybe we should create separate black holding name servers for them so that that traffic would go to the black holding servers rather than the uh, root name servers. And so they created them. And then later, somebody had the brilliant idea what if we anycast these servers? Uh, the initial idea was not to route the servers, uh, ID addresses at all. But then they were routed and then they were any casted, and there are now a lot of uh, mirrors of this side, uh, the any cast uh, side around the world. So they've got their own website, and uh, well, you can go on the website and find out more. I don't want to go. Well, there's one thing I guess I want to say more about this is that now they are expanding this concept into uh, containing more than just these gray zones. They are thinking about all zones that don't really have uh, anything interesting on the global internet, uh, such as uh, dot .local. The top-level domain dot .local is used for local DNS. It doesn't have 
any meaning in the global context. So they're thinking about moving that into into uh, these name servers and so on. Then we host a Terado server and uh, also a, a 64 server. We noticed that when we set up these initially, we had one machine that did 64 and another machine that did Terado. Back then we had a Cisco router, so the Cisco router did 64 and then we had a Linux server doing Terado. We noticed that all the traffic coming from Teledo went into 64 and all the traffic coming from 64 went into Teledo. So uh, when we uh, uh, got rid of the Cisco router, we decided we'll just put both of them on the same virtual machine. So uh, traffic just goes there to be re-encapsulated using the other tunnel protocol and then it comes back. Well, uh, for a long time actually, initially we had some traffic, but then for a long time we didn't really get any traffic uh, on this, but a few weeks ago, if you've uh, been looking at Trek's graphs, a few weeks ago there was a huge spike that has, well, it's not a spike, it's an increase in traffic at Trek's, and it's actually due to this server. I think Fullet stopped announcing their route somewhere, so our route was no longer occluded by uh, the Fullet route, so we've been getting hundreds of megabits of uh, this traffic again. And unfortunately, the way it goes uh, through our network several times, uh, it gets counted several times, so it, it sort of inflates our traffic a bit. We don't really have five gigabits of traffic, as it says on our website currently. I apologize for that. After the workshop, I'm hoping to get to actually fix that. Then there are DNS yeah, set precursors. Uh, so basically, uh, this, was, this project was done maybe five or six years ago. Uh, whenever it, the, the GNSX started to, when it was, basically when the root was signed, the root zone was signed, we decided to set up GNSX servers, uh, resolvers, because uh, Finnish ISPs back then didn't have GNSX uh, capable, validating capable. How many? Uh, minus four. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I'll just launch into something I've been thinking about doing with these. So right now, they are just normal validating NSX servers, but I, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I ran into uh, this thing. Called GetIDNS, uh, which is a system test that uh, that tries to find out how DNSSEC affects uh, the world and especially the root zone. Now they are doing tests that cannot be done on the real root zone before you know that it really works. Uh, so they have set up a separate separate root zone that basically it uh, hosts all the same data as a real root zone, the real root zone, it doesn't have any extra top-level domains or anything. It just run uh, using different uh, root servers in order to, for them to be able to make the tests that they are making. You can find out about everything they do on this website. But what we've been thinking is that we would point our DNSSEC uh, validating resolvers uh, to these root servers and uh, we don't, our ideas, DNSSEC resolvers don't have a lot of users, uh, maybe a few dozen, but uh, we could contribute to their research. And if you have some views on that, get back to me, but I guess I should let you back on the podium. Yes, can you put your hands together for a really hard working organizer?